This is Into the Story, the podcast where you learn English with true stories from all over the world. Stories that connect us and inspire you to get where you want to go. Hi, everyone. It's your host, Bree. I want you to think back to the very start of your career. Imagine the person that you wanted to be and the work that you imagined yourself doing every day. When we begin a new job, especially early on in our career, we usually have some idea of what we'll be doing, but we're not always prepared for what the job will really require from us. Today, we're going into the story of Nikki Richard. When she started her career in human rights, she found herself adapting to a job that required a lot more than she expected. I'm overwhelmed with all of the panic and fear I feel for what might happen to them and and feeling so um, unqualified and unprepared for how to manage the situation. Nikki's story is one many of us can relate to. It's about adapting to what our jobs actually expect of us and handling more than you thought possible. And really quick, before we look at the vocabulary for today's story, if you want more of Into the Story, then you can sign up for my newsletter. Like the show, the newsletter is designed to be interesting, inspiring, and most importantly, improve your English. To sign up for free, visit intothestorypodcast.com. Planning a trip? Whether it's a big adventure or a weekend away, you'll need travel insurance. Last year, my son needed a doctor while we were in Canada. It cost a lot, but my insurance took care of everything without any stress. Plus, they offer the best prices I've seen. Into the Story listeners can get a 5% discount. Just follow the link in the description or visit intothestorypodcast.com slash travel. And now it's time to look at five words and expressions that Nikki uses today. The first, blasting. So if someone is blasting music or air conditioning, it means that they're playing music or running air conditioning at a very high volume or strength. For example, they had the music blasting at the party, or the air conditioning was blasting to cool down the room. Blasting. Next, to cram into. To cram into is to fit many people or things into a small space. For example, we all crammed into the car for the road trip or they crammed into the elevator during rush hour to cram into. And then we have to blend in. If you blend in, it means that you look or you act like the people or things around you so that you are not noticed. For example, she tried to blend in by wearing similar clothes or the animal's fur helped it blend in with its surroundings. To blend in. Then we have tunnel vision. So when you get tunnel vision, it means that you're focusing on one thing and ignoring everything else around you. It's actually like your vision narrows and you can only see or concentrate on this one thing. For example, he had tunnel vision while studying, ignoring his friends, or her tunnel vision kept her from noticing anything else in the room. Tunnel vision. And then finally, we have to shrug. S-H-R-U-G. And this means to lift your shoulders slightly upward to show that you don't know something or you don't care. For example, she shrugged when her friends asked about her plans, or he shrugged his shoulders and walked away. To shrug. 
As always, you can get the full learning pack on our website at intothestorypodcast.com. All right, let's get into the story. It's my first week in Bangkok. The smells, the sights, the colors, it's, it's incredible. It's the most vibrant, alive city I've ever been in. And here I am on Khao San Road. It is a chaotic maze of backpackers. There's blasting music coming from multiple bars all at the same time. There's street vendors selling everything you can imagine from fried scorpions to these triple cocktails that are served in buckets, plastic buckets with like 10 straws in them. Khao San Road is a party that never stops. Loud music, people selling everything you could ever imagine, and probably also things you've never imagined. It's loud, it's messy, it's Bangkok in all its chaotic glory. I get to this small table. There's this man sitting there and he has this board uh, standing up on top of the table that shows all of the samples of the different types of fake IDs that he will make for you for a small fee. So I hand him a list of the names that I would like on the fake IDs along with some photos. And I'm watching as this man with tattooed arms is carefully typing fake names onto plastic cards. He's making fake IDs for my students. After finishing her master's degree in human rights law, Nikki gets a job interview that she thinks she will not get. But she gets it. And she's going to be working with people from Burma who want to be leaders in the human rights movement in their country. And just two weeks later, she's on a plane to Bangkok. I never imagined when I took this job that this would be part of my job description. I imagined myself writing curriculum, teaching in a classroom, and here I am. I have now these laminated fake IDs for Myra, Anna, Thiri, Kamun, so the four young women that are in my class. And the whole idea is to help the students be safe, because in Thailand, it's actually very risky to be undocumented, especially if you're coming from Burma. In Burma, many people from rural areas do not have ID cards or passports. And when they leave Burma, they become undocumented migrants. If they're caught in Thailand, it can be serious. They can be arrested, held in prison, or sent back to their country. For many years, the Burmese military has been fighting against its own people, people who want democracy and basic human rights. Because of this conflict, Thailand, which is just across the border, has become a safer place for those working in Burma's human rights movement. So this is the extremely complicated situation that Nikki is coming into. And does she feel prepared for this job? Not quite. I don't know the language at all. I'm completely unfamiliar with the culture. Yet, I find myself here. I'm here to train young women from Burma in political empowerment and women's rights. The students are these amazing young women who are smart, they're ambitious, they are hoping to be leaders within their communities, in their country. The work Nikki is doing is very secretive. She's been told not to tell anyone what she actually does. The NGO, this non-governmental organization, is a school, and it's surrounded by high fences. Even when they're outside having their lunch, they have to speak quietly. It's all about keeping the students safe. They are the ones most at risk. And this is just inside the school. Soon, Nikki will need to take the students on a trip where the risk is much higher. 
So one month into this new job, I'm finally able to take the students on an outing. And we head out of Bangkok to a port city where thousands of Burmese migrant workers are working in the fishing industry as laborers. So we cram into a typical Thai minivan, which is quite an experience. You are packed shoulder to shoulder with strangers. There's Thai pop music that's blaring so loudly, it hurts your ears. The air conditioning is just blasting, making your whole body shiver because you're coming out of this intense, sticky, humid heat. All of us are dressed to blend in. So we're wearing comfortable, simple clothes. They're all dressed to avoid being noticed. Each one carries a small bag. And inside the students' bags are their fake IDs. Even though they're not leaving Thailand, they are going to a city just along the coast, not far from Bangkok. They still must carry their IDs on them at all times. So as the van pulls up to the port, we get out, we have to walk maybe about 10 minutes, and all of a sudden it just opens up and we see the sea. And there's all of these huge fishing boats and trawlers that are just jam-packed docks along the port. And I can tell that everybody working here is actually from Burma because the women have this what's called tanaka on their face. They use it as a natural sunscreen, but it actually comes from um, the bark of a tree and they make it into this yellowish paste and they make beautiful circular designs on their cheeks. And all of the men are wearing uh, the traditional long jeans, which are the skirts um, that people wear from Burma that go all the way down to their ankles. And they just have these huge fishing nets with these massive catches that you can see spread out all along the pavement everywhere you look. So if I didn't know what was behind this, I would think, yeah, these are just, wow, really hardworking people just doing their job. Um, but actually, I was here to speak with local organizations, with labor rights groups, with women's rights groups, to better understand the conditions that these people were working in, which actually can be highly, highly exploitative and really terrible. Nikki and her students spend the day listening to stories. Stories of undocumented Burmese migrants who came to Thailand for work and ended up trapped on fishing boats for months, sometimes even years. One woman speaks of her brother, who got a job on one of these boats and was never heard from again. Another man shares how he escaped after months at sea, but has nothing left. No money, nowhere to go. These stories are everywhere, Nikki realizes. Burmese men and women taken by a system that sees them as invisible. I can see just some pain on my students' faces. Like, these are people from their home. These are people from their country. And they understand why they're here. This was the first time that all of us had been here and seen it firsthand up close for myself. I had read a lot of these reports, but actually meeting with people who were experiencing it, it felt, I guess, real and heavy. Nikki and her students finish their meetings and they walk back to the place where the minivans are going to take them back to Bangkok. We get back in the van and we all just sort of sit there in silence. I mean, there's still the Thai pop music playing on the speakers, but I think all of us are just a bit more in our heads. I think just reflecting on the day, reflecting on the stories that we've heard, um, and really felt exhausted, just kind of drained. Um, and I was really looking forward to just getting back to Bangkok, getting back to my apartment, having a nice cold shower, getting to bed early. So as we pull up to Bangkok, we are getting off at this 
stop where two of the metro lines meet, all of the minivans that are coming from this part of the country are all stopping in this one location. And I kind of had my head resting on the window and I see that we're coming into our spot. So I sit up and I look over to the curb where the van is is approaching and is about to let us off. And I see a lineup of police officers. And I see them stopping the minivan that's pulled up in front of us. And I know exactly what's happening. I immediately feel this just knot in my stomach. I know that they're asking for people to show their IDs because they're looking for undocumented migrant workers. And I have these four students with me who are carrying only their fake IDs. My palms start to sweat. My heart is pounding so loud. I can't even hear the music anymore. And I just look over at my students and They look back at me, just these wide eyes, and they say nothing because they also know exactly what's happening. And I just say to them quietly, it's okay, just follow my lead. Their van pulls up to the curb, and a police officer opens the door, looks at them, and says sharply, passports. I pull out my Canadian passport, I'm also with my Italian colleague, and she does the same. I look to the students and I tell them to get out their student IDs. So each of them reaches in their bag, they pull it out. I can see Myra's hands are just trembling and they pass over their ID cards to me. I don't even know if I'm breathing at this point as I hand them over to the officer. He takes one look at them and he shakes his head and he says, my chai, which means no. He says, get out. So they all step out of the minivan. We're all standing on the sidewalk now and he points at me and he says, you go get passports. And he points to my colleague and the four students and he says, you stay here. I look over at my colleague and we make eye contact and we understand what we need to do. We've had this conversation, but it still just feels completely surreal. And my mind is just racing with what's going to happen to them. How am I going to make sure that these women are okay? Will they be arrested? Will they be in jail? Will I need to pay a bribe? Will they be kicked out of the country and set home? I just, I'm overwhelmed with all of the panic and fear I feel for what might happen to them and, and feeling so unqualified and unprepared for how to manage the situation. Nikki runs straight to the line of taxis. She quickly opens the door to the first one that stops and starts to give the driver instructions to her office. At the same time, she pulls out her phone and scrolls through. I'm trying to find the number of the lawyer to call in this situation for help. And I just have tunnel vision. My heart is racing. My hands are trembling, but I know I need to be moving fast. I find his number and I'm just about to call and then I hear my name being shouted. I look up and there are my students running at me. (laughs) Their faces are just lit up in what looks like relief. And I look behind them and I don't see a police officer in sight. I'm completely speechless. I'm just standing there in complete shock. And I ask them, like, what what is going on? Why are you here? 
And one of the students just laughed and shrugged and said, I don't know. He just shook his head and said, go, leave. <laughs> and they didn't ask a question. They just ran. I, to this day, have no idea what happened and why he let them go. So we all pile into a taxi. At this point, we're just laughing, like hysterically, because all of the nerves are just releasing. Um, and I was actually so relieved that there was actually just some tears that started like just quietly falling down my face. I just was so, so glad that they were okay, that we were okay, and that we were just going back home. Over the next 12 years, Nikki would have many experiences like this one. She started her career thinking she would teach others about rights and freedom, but this was the first time she really saw what it's like to live without freedom of movement. And she began to see that what feels very basic to her is just a dream for many people she works with. It was also the first time she realized that her real job wasn't to teach, but to listen, to learn from the people that she wants to help. I thought that they needed what I had to offer. And it was such a humbling experience to then learn from them that actually the first thing that I need to do is to sit and be quiet and just listen and learn from them. And it's amazing in, in my job now, this is 12 years later after this moment in Bangkok, I continue to meet with organizations, human rights organizations, women's rights groups from Burma, and I still run into some of these women that I used to teach, and now they're leaders of their organizations. They're doing incredible things, and they're extremely respected and powerful and knowledgeable, and I feel honored to be getting a meeting with them <laughs> most of the time. Careers, the jobs that we do, are interesting, and they're almost never what we expected. They challenge us, show us strengths that we didn't know we had, and if we're lucky, can change how we see the world. Nikki Richard works with the Canadian social justice organization, Interpars, where she focuses on fundraising, advocacy, and raising awareness to support human rights and women rights activists from Burma. For more information, you can visit interpars.ca slash Burma. And I will also leave you a link in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening to the show this week. If you're interested in insights and ideas to improve your English and speak with more confidence, then please sign up for my newsletter at intothestorypodcast.com. Please make sure to click the follow button on your podcast app so that you never miss a new episode of the show. And if you have a moment, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. Every single review helps, and I really appreciate your support. Okay, that's all for today, folks. Until the next time, I hope that you have a good time, or at least a good story to tell. Mm -hmm.